We're talking blogging today and not just a business blog. Some of you out there write a wonderful personal blog. There we go. Um, and so you might want to be, uh, you know, you might be one of those people wanting to start a personal blog. And some of you, oh, oh, Steve, is that true? Okay, the last two uh, Facebook Lives I've done horizontal, I've done landscape. And, and then today I put it on and it's only uh, portrait. Who knows? Facebook, make up your mind here. Um, but we're going to talk about blogging. So, hey, Steve and Clarence and Kirsty, I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving. And Nettie, hey to you. Again, we're going to talk about blogging. And I first have to introduce you to a little friend. I don't know if you can see her laying on the chair here, sleeping. She's having separation anxiety. Um, this is little Phoebe. We got a little puppy. Just what we needed was another puppy in our life. So, um, yes, we have two Chewinis and a, doxa, a miniature dachshund. So, um, you know, I don't know. I'm the crazy dog lady. That's what I am. I'm now the cr official crazy dog lady. So, <laughs> uh, that is Phoebe. In case she wakes up, I may have to pick her up and have her join us. But, um wanted to talk about blogging and the reason is I had a really long discussion with someone uh, I don't know if it was yesterday or day before but she has a great blog about motherhood and um, she's been blogging for two years and she was asking some questions about her blog and this is Kristen so Kristen if you're out there um, chime in here with your questions more questions but um, I've, I've been blogging for, I want to say, 12 years. And I started with one blog. And then I was asked to blog about a topic. Um, our son, our older son went through um, Columbine High School, all the shootings and, and uh, chaos there <clears throat> many years ago, thankfully. Um, but I was on a show where we talked about um, you know, kind of going through that and how our family dealt with things. And so I wanted, he wanted me to write a blog about it on my blog. Well, my blog is a business blog. So I really couldn't write about it on my business blog. So I started another blog called uh, Gina Unplugged. <laughs> so I have had that blog for a couple years now. And then, of course, I have our DIY.social, which is a membership group, and I have a blog on there. So I've got three different blogs going, and um, it, it is a big commitment when you have a blog going. So it's interesting. I'm curious how many of you out there have a blog. If you have a blog, put the link in there so we can check out your blog. Um, I would love to do that so we can all share our blogs with each other. This this camera is just really weird right now. I don't I don't like what it's doing. Um, weird Facebook, make up your mind here. But um, yeah, write your blog and put that um, in here. So why a blo blog versus a website? Kirstie, that's a great question. And, and here's why everyone should blog. I, and I believe everyone should have a blog, whether it's for a personal, your business. I believe everyone should blog for the purpose of sharing your stories and your experiences. So, and I'm, I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago where, you know, in the past we had stories. We, we sat and told stories with one another and we passed along our stories and our heritage through stories. Well, now we don't. We, we, you know, we might interview our parents or grandparents, hopefully before they pass to get those stories that we can get down. Um, you know, so it's, it's one of those things that I think a blog is a great way to pass on the story. So my personal blog is truly personal stuff. So I, I wrote about, and it's, it's random. It's really, I'm writing on that blog, Gina Unplugged. I wrote about my trip to Kilimanjaro and the, you know, the things that went on on our climb there. I, I wrote about, um, moving when we moved to Chicago and the emotions. <laughs> I was a basket case every day. I would tell our team, okay, I had another breakdown, but I'm over it. Um, so I, I write personal stuff there, but not regularly because I'm not trying to promote that blog. So that's really more of a heritage or a legacy blog. And I want to capture certain stories and events that um, 
I want my family to read or I write them for other people who are going through those. And I keep saying one of these days I'm going to take that blog more seriously and write more religiously because, you know, I there's so many things that happen that are great stories. But Kirstie, the reason I have it separate is Social Connects is not about Gina Shrek. So Social Connects, our business, where I blog, our business blog, is... Um, you know, I might sell that business someday. And so it's, there's no part, well, there is a part of that website that I, I have my speaking, um, pieces on there. But again, that is a, a page that can be removed easily. I'm, that, that site is not about Gina Shrek. It's about the marketing services that we provide. And we have a, a big team. And, you know, again, it's beyond Gina. So that's why I have it separate. Um, and then the other blog, DIY Social, is a membership site. So on that blog, it's really targeting. I have three different targets, I guess you would say. So DIY Social is targeting entrepreneurs who want help with their marketing and business growth. DIY or, uh, Social Connects is managed services. So the posts on there are slightly different. There's sometimes that they're that they're the same, but that that's why I have three. Um, and I think really, if I wanted to, I could combine DIY. I actually thought about doing DIY social as a piece of social connects. But again, there's such different business models that I ended up um, creating a separate website. And again, it's a membership site. So um, it's behind a, a wall, a paywall. Um, and so that is a different blog purpose. Um, but you know, you might be blogging for the purpose, like I was talking about, uh, Kristen and her blog is just a beautiful blog, um, about being a new mom and the challenges. And she has an adopted, um, okay, now I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but I think she has a child with special needs, a child, she says a child that was born from a teenage pregnancy, a child with special needs. She's, you know, got this wonderful experience, um, being a mom of four children. And she's writing about that, um, on this blog. So to me, and it's, uh, Kristen Pratt, I'll put her link to her blog because it's a great blog. If you're a new mom for me, I kind of look at it and I was like, Oh, thank, thank the Lord. I'm past all that. Um, but there's so much wisdom that you gain from all of our experiences, whether it's, um, parenting, whether it's running a business, whether it's speaking, traveling, we all have experiences that I believe we should be sharing through a blog. Now, you know, sure, we could write it in a, dart, a diary and keep those. And I, I have a book years ago before blogging. I, I had a, um, a file I kept online and anytime there were funny stories or lessons, I would write these stories down and I would type them up and I, I would use a lot of those in my speaking. And then one day I thought, you know, I should, I should publish this just for my kids because they were just funny stories about life and, and a lot of them about them. And so I ended up publishing this little book and, um, I'd sell them when I was speaking, but I really, the intent was I was writing this book for, um, again, a legacy uh, to leave the stories behind. And I feel this sense of obligation. And maybe it's as you get older, you feel an obligation to share what we've learned along our journey with other people. And, and if it's one person or if it's a, a million people, it doesn't matter. And I think that's one thing that people get hung up with. Um, when they blog, they feel like, what if no one is reading it? Um, you know, I always say blog because you have wisdom to share. Don't blog because you're trying to make money. So blog for the love of sharing your experiences. And then if you want to look at how to monetize it, um, there are things you can do, but first you have to build a following on a blog. So in order to monetize a blog, to get advertisers or sponsors, you have to drive a lot of eyeballs to that site. And as a matter of fact, for a lot of our clients, Social Connects clients, we go to other blogs and we um, buy advertising space or we sponsor a post on their blog so that they'll promote our clients' products. And that blogger is making money by selling that advertising space and that um, blog promotion every for every post. So that to me is a great way. And they'll they'll make anywhere from the blogs that we're contacting, and these are usually the top um, you know, 10 blogs, and there's lists out there in your industry for the top bloggers. And 
for those they're making for small ads 150 a month to 500 a month and some of them um, we have one that's their their rates are 7,000 but they'll they'll write a blog post about your product and then they will promote it on Facebook promote it on their social channels and so forth and so what we look for is do they have a large following on Twitter and Facebook um, so that we'll get a good reach and do they have what's their readership well that is another question a lot of people say is how do I know for sure how many readers well first thing is make sure you add Google Analytics to any of your websites or blogs because you need data if you're trying to monetize a blog advertisers are not going to give you money if, if you can't tell them how many people read your blog and um, they need that kind of data in order to shell out money so if you want to monetize um, you know in a big way then you need to have lots of viewerships and I'm talking you know a hundred thousand viewers plus um, on your blog every month and obviously the more viewers you have the more money you can ask for but there's small ways you can monetize because you might be able to partner with someone who has a product that they want to get in front of an audience that you're that you're writing for and they're willing to pay a smaller amount or you can sign up and become an affiliate for things so even on Amazon if you're an affiliate you can put links but you're making pennies I mean any of you who, who sell anything on um, you know on Amazon you know you make nothing on Amazon the affiliate program hey Kristen Kristen Sprouts here yay what kind of stats should you have before you monetize yeah hundred I mean again you can monetize I mean I, I threw out a hundred thousand but you can monetize I know people who get you know probably 20,000 viewers on their website on their blog and they they have someone that they know personally who wants to partner with them and say hey I'd love to put one of my products or one of my ads on your blog and have you or have you write about it and promote my service and I'll pay you so you know but but typically when you're starting to sell advertising um, you're getting lots of viewers on that blog so monetizing it you know again affiliates if you talk about products all the time which I don't typically talk talk I say that but almost every time I'm on I'm talking about my camera holder my the the iographer or the little light um, that I use and my tripods and my microphones so if you write about um, products definitely um, you know look into becoming an affiliate because because to sign up even on Amazon as an affiliate is super easy like within within 30 minutes you're signed up and then they approve you and the way they approve you is once you sell a product on your site from their link that you take um, then you're approved so you have to sell one thing to kind of be in and then you can make a percentage but again Amazon I mean I sell books on Amazon and you make nothing you know any any author will tell you writing is not the way to become rich so um, blogging I always say is more of a heart project but it also sets you up to make money as a thought leader in another way so for example if you are a, a thought leader and Kristen this is where you'd fall into this category um, and you blog about something and you get people that talk about it and you share it places somebody's gonna say hey I want you to come and speak at our conference and I want you to talk about the things that you write about then you can get paid to speak at a conference so blogging can be monetized in other ways off of your blog and you can get business I mean I blog on our social connect site for sharing information but also so that people will see okay they know what they're talking about I want to hire a company to do this for us um, their blog posts are really helpful and it kind of gets you in the door and that's more content marketing I mean content marketing is using your content strategically to pull people in to your business um, so to me monetizing might go beyond that um, let me see why I I'm looking at questions that I magnified <laughs> so I could actually see it um, Ronald says will a video blog get me more traction than a written one um, Ronald so here's the deal on on video blogs number one a video blog will have more reach 
on some platforms. So for example, if you take a Facebook Live and you use that as a video blog, so you take the embed code when you're done um, and you put that on your website, Facebook is gonna get you more reach with your video on Facebook. Um, and then you're going to be able to transcribe this video and then upload that onto your website because if you just have the video, here's the deal, Google can't read any words coming from your blog or from your video unless you either have it transcribed or upload an SRT file. And an SRT file is the transcript, is the uh, closed caption, if you will, um, which on a YouTube video, <laughs> It's a little complicated, but YouTube will automatically transcribe, not always accurately. If you have an accent, um, Kirsty, you would know this. Any of you who have an accent, uh, Google has no idea most of the time what you're saying. So typically you have to have someone else transcribe it. And I, I initially went to Fiverr and found somebody who would transcribe um, videos for us and she does it really inexpensive and now we just send her stuff directly. It's been probably six, seven years. But transcribing it, uploading that transcription onto your site, onto your YouTube channel in the description, it adds Google juice because now you have SEO, Google can now see words. So yes, a video can um, get you more reach because it kind of has two ways that you're, you're able to capture um, your audience through words and through the video. And typically if you're gonna use a video, I like having a transcript because Sometimes I'd rather read things quickly instead of watching a video, and sometimes I'd rather watch the video. Um, so you can do that. So yeah, I, I think a video blog is more interesting too. Um, Kirsty says, I have a hundred articles and posts on my website. You know, it's interesting because to me, as long as you're putting regular content out um, and you have your articles in an area, let's say it's under resources, so you've got articles, as long as you're putting regular content out and you're constantly promoting to drive traffic to those articles, it's typically, it's, it's pretty much like technically, not typically, it's technically the same thing. So let's say every week you load an article or every week you load a video or every week you load a blog. Um, it's the same. The difference is on a blog, there are places where you can add um, and actually there's a couple things because how you load your articles, if it's a PDF, that's not searchable. A PDF is a locked document. So Google is not seeing the text the same. If you're loading it as text on your website, so technically it's a new page every time you load an article, then Google sees that as new content on your website, which is really great for SEO, search engine optimization. For those of you going, what the heck is she saying SEO? Um, so for the search engines like Google, Bing, all of those, to search your site, they want to see content. And a blog is new content. And when you load a blog, it has areas for you to put um, metadata. And don't get intimidated by this because all it is is on every page of your website, there's areas that Google wants to see a little bit of um, keyword information, a little bit of a description of, tell tell our search engines, or they'll call them web crawlers or spiders, um, which just is creepy, I don't know why they call it that, but um, the web crawlers, tell us what this page or this post is about. So your metadata is a little short snippet, and all of you have seen this, when you do a Google search for something and you say, um, you know, over the knee boots, <laughs> stores in Colorado, whatever, whatever you type in Google, um, what pops up in your search results is the title. So you'll see that in bold that Google gives you the title and then it gives a little snippet and the snippet is metadata. It's the description of that page that it's about to take you to and that Google can pull automatically, or not Google, your your website, so WordPress will pull automatically the first few sentences from your blog post, but a lot of times it makes no sense, so it's not the enticing um, words that should be on there. So to me, metadata 
don't leave those boxes blank on your on your blog post or every web page on your website when you load new content tell google this is what i want to show up when somebody does a search for this topic i want this little snippet of information so it's enticing people to click because they're going to have 10 choices right so you want it to be enticing so that's what metadata also on a blog typically you're going to load a photo um, and every photo has what they call an alt tag. Alt tags are just the little description of what is this picture you just loaded. Now, technically, an alt tag is so that if your computer does not load a picture, and it just has a little box with an X, if your computer does not load a picture and you hover over the X, it tells you what this was. So it says, this was a picture of a dog. Um, I look at it as an opportunity to put your a meta description, a little bit of what you want. So let's say that I have a picture of a, a person typing at the computer. Instead of in my alt tag put person typing at computer, I'm going to put blogging tips so that it's a, it's a keyword that ties in with that photo. Hopefully that's not too technical. Um, but it, that's the difference, uh, Kirstie. A, a blog gives, it's a, a page on your website, so it gives you opportunity for lots of um, SEO, Google juice versus an article, a lot of times they're loaded as PDFs and that is not searchable. It's not, um, you'd have to really tag that article. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I just looked at like the other screen and I'm going like this. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm scary with my hands. Um, <laughs> I can't talk without my hands. Um, so. Hopefully that makes sense. Hey Susie, good to see you. Um, so that's why I think everybody should blog. I think everyone should blog because you are sharing your information and it helps more people see your content on your site and find your website. Now, how to start a blog. I wanna tell you how simple it is because I told you I have three blogs. The personal blog, Gina Unplugged, when I first started, I just went to WordPress and I signed up for the free WordPress.com. So then my URL was WordPress.com slash Gina Unplugged. But it was still a WordPress URL, but it was free. I didn't really care. I wasn't trying to promote that. I just um, wanted to start blogging personally there. But then I realized for $3 a month, $3 a month, it gets the URL and it takes the wordpress.com piece off. So for three bucks a month, I think I paid $30 for the year. Um, it, I have ginaunplugged.com. So you don't even have to go to um, GoDaddy or register um, sites to register the URL. WordPress basically does it for you. And for $30 a year. So again, to start a blog costs nothing. And then they even have themes. So WordPress to me is the best way to go. And it's um, it just has so many great things for optimizing your content. And then um, it, it's easy to use. It's like typing in a Word document. So there's um, familiar features on there. So you understand, okay, this is bold. You don't have to know coding or anything. You literally just open it, say new post and start typing. And um, you know, and Kirsty, if you, if your posts, I don't know this, but if your articles were in PDFs, I would take each one of them. Um, you would need the Word document first, but I would copy and paste them into a blog because now every one of those words um, is searchable. And you, Google also, if you want to get technical, I we, we need to do a show on just basic SEO things because if you make the headers for every paragraph, um, don't just make them bold, but turn them into H2 tags. So um, search engines look at the way the search engine reads is they read your title. So does your title have keywords that people are searching for? Then they look at your um, header, the headings for each paragraph, which are H2 tags, because H1 is the title. H2 tags would be the, the next category. So the Google bots read the, the H1 and H2 tags first to get an idea. What is this page about? Is this page about what people are searching for? I'll match them. 
Um, and then they look at the content, then they look at the words and the, the metadata and the meta description on your photos. So there's a lot that goes into, um, making a site, um, you know, kind of organically findable. And, you know, I, I meet with a lot of clients who say, well, I pay somebody every month, lots of money to, um, optimize our site. And I said, well, what are they doing? And they said, we don't know. Um, and I, I'll just log into the back end with them right there and we'll look. And many times there's no alt tags on pictures. Um, there's no meta description on the pages. There's no H1 tags, H2 tags, which are just the basic things that you have to have on your site to have it findable. And they say, well, they say that they're doing backlinks, they're, they're creating backlinks and they're doing, um, put, getting us in directories. And I said, I would ask them just again, there are very good companies that do wonderful work in the SEO field, but make sure you understand enough about it. So you know how to, um, so you know what you're paying for. And so I would say if they're saying that they're getting backlinks, I would ask for a list of who's linking to us, what sites, because a backlink means another website thinks you're a great resource and they're, they're putting on their site. Here's a great resource. It's like if I write a blog post and I say, Oh, Hootsuite is a great tool for a social media dashboard. I'm linking to Hootsuite. That's a backlink going to Hootsuite. So they're getting links showing that they're an authority. Well, if somebody's telling you that they're getting you links, you should see a list every month of links that they're getting you. And if they're saying that they're getting people, um, to look, to put you in a directory, then you should get a list of what are the directories? Where am I listed? So enough about that. I won't go down that path too far, but, um, but why start a blog and how? So again, it's super easy. Um, let me see if there's any questions. SEO for dummies video. Yeah, Kristen, I need to do, I'll do some because SEO is one of those things that's just a scary, um, intimidating area of our websites. But once you understand how basic it is that it empowers you, number one, to do a lot of stuff on your site that, um, really helps your site be more findable. And it's just thinking, what are the questions that the Google searcher types into Google? And if I could make sure that I'm taking those questions that people are searching for and incorporate those into the titles of my posts and making sure I'm putting those headers occasionally in. Again, you don't want to write as if you're writing for Google because then it sounds weird, but you do want to consider that to be more findable on your site. And there's just simple things. And once you understand it, you're like, Oh, I don't, I may not need to pay SEO, um, to have somebody doing SEO work every month. Now, I'm not saying that that shouldn't be done because there are there are ways that people can do very ethical SEO, but there's a lot, still a lot of companies. And just last week I met with a doctor's office and we were talking about their marketing and I went and looked at their website and they were paying $3,000 a month to have SEO work done. And none of their pages had alt tags on images and none of their things. So I was just like, oh my gosh, that's the basic stuff that should have been done. Um, so going off of that. So everybody I think should start blogging. It's simple to do. It's very inexpensive. Um, and I just feel like it's one of those things that if you're blogging for the love of sharing content and sharing your stories, um, it's just a great release as well. Now, how often should you blog? Oh, that's another tough one because you see some of these companies and it's intimidating because they blog every day. But then you look and they have 15 writers and they have a team that sits there every day and puts out, they have a content calendar and you know, this person's writing on this topic and this person's writing that topic. Um, if you can write once a week, that's an awesome goal. I think that's one of, you know, that's like the target you want to start with is once a week, write a blog post. And if you can do it more often, even better, because the more often you have content coming from your site, the better Google sees that site as a resource. So again, not that you're writing just for Google, but the more they see that you're putting out regular content that's helpful, um, the better. Now, is blogging easy to do? No, because to write a blog post, you wanna write things that are helpful. It's just like social media, be interesting, be helpful, or be quiet. So if you're writing something that everyone else is talking about, then it's not that helpful or interesting because it's everywhere else. If you're writing a unique spin, um, then that's what you want. But then if you're researching things, there's a lot of work involved in that and you're having to link to other sources and um, research that. But 
to me, the easiest kind of blog is a personal blog because there's no research. You're blogging from your experiences. Um, you're sharing your love of your topic and your industry. And so I think that's um, the best way to start. Let me see, what are your thoughts on focusing on a niche, a niche area versus many topics under one large umbrella? Um, obviously, the more targeted you can be with your blog, the better your blog is going to be and the more likely it will be found. Because think about this, when we do a search for, um, if I did a search right now just for blogs on healthy eating, well, that's just, there's millions of blogs. <laughs> there's not millions, but there's thousands and hundreds of thousands of blogs on healthy eating. But if I do a blog on um, paleo diet, a little more specific. Now, if I do a search for um, paleo cooking for women, um, or paleo cooking for women over 50. Do you see how the more specific I am, now I'm gonna find my people. And my people are gonna find me because I'm not in one of 100,000 blogs, I'm in one of maybe 50 blogs. And so the more niche you can be, the better your your blog can be found because Google will know this blog and this comes back to keywords and making sure your blog has those keywords in there. So if you're blogging for paleo uh, women over 50, you have to have those keywords sprinkled in your blog posts and sprinkled on your website so that Google knows um, this blog is what this person over here is searching for. If you are just tagging it with um, healthy eating, you are now bundled with millions of blog posts and content coming from huge organizations. So they're gonna rise to the top because they're blogging more often. So um, yeah, definitely the more niche you can be, the more, and it's hard because, you know, in marketing, I know when you say, when you ask somebody, who's your target audience? And they say, well, everybody. Um, okay, just everybody who lives in the United States or just everybody who's over the age of 25 and under the age of 100. Um, so, you know, the when you have these huge audience pools, it's just hard to get a lot of traction and findability. Um, so yeah, niche market, always better, always easier for you to, um, to do that. Um, and I just realized, oh, I never shared this video with our DIY social group. If you haven't joined our DIY social group, you need to join. You need to um, just go to, just search in, in uh, Facebook, DIY social, and you'll see it. A little uh, flower group. And there we go. Let me put that there. I always forget. I got it. I've got to have somebody else logged in, I guess, and able to share that. Um, so on blogging, let me know what other questions you have because I can go down all kinds of random um, tangents on this. And Dwight, Dwight is in the house. I see your name out there. And Dwight is our web manager and has been for Dwight. I always say like 15 or 16 years. But it might even be longer than that because we started our business 21 years ago and you designed, I think, our maybe our second blog, I mean, our second website. Um, maybe the first one I probably attempted and it, it looked like a brochure. Um, I don't know. But I think it's like been 16 years, Dwight, that you have been managing. And Dwight knows um, about how to set up a blog. And it's interesting because I what I was just saying to someone is... Um, when you have a, a website designed, there's web designers who make it look beautiful. There's the people who code it to make it work. And then there's SEO people who make sure that it's set up. Um, make sure when you're having a site you know, done that you think of all three elements because there's more to it than just um, making it look pretty. And usually we're concerned with the pretty factor. So um, let me see, Ronald, your question. There we go. Um, move this so I can actually see it. Your question is, um, have I done any work with Facebook instant articles? It's interesting, we have not. And we've we've toyed around with that, but I'm, I'm seeing mixed results from that. So if anybody else is um, doing that, I'm, and we've even done um, some things where we take a blog post and we put it on LinkedIn as a post, as a, um, 
pulse post so on your LinkedIn profile uh, that's one way to have your profile be beefier is to um, put your blog posts in as a post with an image so on your LinkedIn profile you've got all your blog content there and someone else asks is that considered duplicate content because if you if Google sees that you're scraping your site and putting it on another site for example if I took social connects content scraped it and just plopped it on DIY social um, Google would see that as duplicate content and you get penalized but your blog posts sharing it on social media is not considered duplicate content I tend to wait a week or two take a blog post that I've published on our website wait a couple weeks and then publish it on LinkedIn so that it kind of gives more life into um, that blog post and then you can take it and put it on Facebook as a note um, so you can do lots of things with a blog post to kind of extend the life of it which is what I was going to talk about is how to promote it but um, Ronald says yeah that's what I've seen finding your own articles can be a journey yeah it's interesting you know to me the way for you to get your blogs out there to a bigger audience it it takes a little bit of work and um, Kristen this is where you and I were talking about it's it's like you have to set up a machine so we take a blog post we'll publish the blog post we have an image for that blog post then what we do is we take that blog post and we write three to five different headlines that promote that blog post so let's say I have a blog post um, I just wrote one and you should you would think I could remember it well I just wrote one uh, two days ago on my personal blog about the umbrella man uh, and I if I wanted to promote that I would say um, you know import maybe one headline is important lessons uh, for the holiday season to de-stress let's say that I wrote that headline another headline might be um, how a strange man at the beach taught me a very important lesson um, that could be headline number two so I'm gonna write different headlines they all have the same link because I'm promoting the same blog post but I write three to five different headlines you can use three to five different images or maybe two or three different images and then what you do is you take that all those posts five posts for one blog post you now have uh, three to five social posts and those become social media posts because if I promoted the same headline every day on Twitter or Facebook you know it's just the same content but if you promoted it let's say on Monday morning you promoted your blog content and then let's say Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening you're probably gonna hit a different audience because people log in at different times and you'll hit a different group on Wednesday evening so you have but if you have a different image and a different headline it's like a totally different post and then let's say Saturday morning I want to catch Saturday and Sunday readers because that's usually a peak time for people to catch up on social and so I will put a third headline there and then what we do is we take these headlines and we put them into a tool um, we use a social jukebox so social jukebox is one there's another one called meet Edgar for some reason on our team half our team uses meet Edgar half our team uses social connect or social jukebox and they're just tools that you can load all of your posts and it will mix them up and they'll say okay I'm gonna put this out um, and you set the schedule I want this to go out no more no closer than let's say tw every 20 days or every 10 days and it will um, each one so remember I have five headlines each one will go out no more than 20 to 30 days or whatever I set it so this one might go out today it's not gonna repeat for 20 days but the second one will go out at a different day different time and if you take all of your blog posts and you write five headlines you've got a lot of social posts and what social jukebox and Edgar does is it keeps them going you don't have to remember every week oh I've got to still I've got to re-promote that blog post from three weeks ago that I wrote it's gonna keep promoting your old content and then you just keep every week adding the new um, the reason that's important is people always write a blog post or an article and they're just excited it's a great post and you're so happy with it um, maybe you know handful of people read it then you go see it was a waste of time but what if a month from now people see the post again and they go to it and then they share it and it, it keeps your blog alive and again we've got blog posts from 2010 that still get traction because we're still promoting it's still relevant content so I think that's a um, 
a good one. And Kirsty, it was great seeing you. And let me know if you have questions on it. Um, Google doesn't ding you. Oh, Heidi, your, I think your question was um, for posting your blog post on your social sites. No, because your social sites are still an extension of your site. It's not like you're taking it and putting it on someone else's site. Now, if somebody wants me to write a guest post, which is another um, good strategy for driving more traffic to your blog, is guest blog on other people's blogs. So let's say that you know Mary has a blog and it's on marketing and she wants me to um, write a blog post for her audience. It gets posted on her site. If I wanted to reuse that on my site, I would need to write a paragraph that says this was originally posted on this, you know, on Mary's blog, and I put the link to that, and and then Google sees that you're you're um, you're repurposing or reposting. If you are taking someone else's blog content and you're posting it on yours, um, that is not a good thing. But if you are, let's say you're a company, and one of our clients, we actually do this. They're a, they're an association, and so we take members' blog posts and we use those on the association blog. And what we do is we write a paragraph that tells why we think this is a great article, why we think this is a great post, and we will write that paragraph and then say, here's the original post, link back to their site, gives them a backlink, and then we post there for members who would never have found that other blog. So there are ways to do that, um, but sharing it on your own social sites are, is completely, um, you're not penalized. You could Google that, that you'll see. That's actually legit. <laughs> yes. and. Uh, Kirstie, I'll put the links on there for reusing content later. Yeah, Meet Edgar and Social Jukebox, I will put those on there. Um, those are great tools for helping your evergreen content stay alive. And, you know, it, the more content you put in there, the better. And those are, f well, Edgar's not free. Edgar's um, has a higher price tag and it does a little more. But um, Social Jukebox has a free version until you have 300. I think 300 is the number posts in there. Once you have 300 posts, then you have to pay. Um, but the more posts you have, like some of our clients, we have 12, 1300 posts in there because they have so much content that we want to keep going. But you know, it's not, it's not re uh, showing that post for a month. And then all of a sudden it's at a different day, different